Assalamu alaikum viewers, welcome to virtual university. We are going to look at ways of organizing texts again. In the last two lessons, we examined ways of organizing long texts such as essays and we looked in detail at four types of linear descriptions, linear organization. The first was chronological writing, which is writing about events in time. The second was describing processes in linear sequence. And third was describing a cyclic process. And the fourth was how to show cause and effect relationships. Now, in today's lesson, we are going to consider two more ways of organizing texts. And these are spatial relationships, how to show spatial relationships, and second, classification. Now, what are spatial relationships? We shall look at some of the conventions that are used in the description of spatial relation, relationships. And you will be provided practice in writing spatial descriptions. The word spatial means dealing with, happening, or existing in space. While writing, very often we have to describe the location of a place, or how a place is laid out, or, or how a set of things or objects are connected. Now, you shall look at some ways of describing things spatially. There's a passage for you. Read it and note the expressions which tell the reader where the place is. The title is Shiraz Center. Shiraz Center is a complex mixture of high and low buildings on the edge of Shadara and the adjoining locality of Gujranwala, just to the northeast of Lahore. Although the site itself was industrial wasteland, it is in the heart of a residential district. Along one side of it runs a rail track, but in every other direction it is surrounded by bungalows and double-story apartment flats. Both Shadara and Gujranwala are fairly prosperous areas, but Gujranwala in particular has undergone extensive industrial development. Now, in this passage that you looked at, some of the expressions in the text tell you what various places are or were and the expression Shiraz center is a mixture of high and low complex of buildings. This in itself tells you what is Shiraz center. There are other expressions that tell you where various places are or were. Example, you have this sentence over there, Shiraz center building, or the, on the edge of Shadara and the adjoining locality of Gujranwala. Now that expression is related to place, while the earlier one was about what Shiraz center is. It tells you it was a mixture of high and low buildings. Right? Now, there are basically two ways of organizing a description of a place. One way is to describe the place as, it, as if it was being seen from the air, what is called a bird's eye view. The other is to describe it from the point of view of a pedestrian or 
of a walk through the place which is known as a pedestrian's point of view, the pedestrian's view. Now, this description may be detailed as you would have in a novel, or it could be general, or it could be very technical, as for example, when a botanist is describing the petals of a plant. The description may be detailed as in a novel or general, or it can be very technical, as when a botanist is describing the petals of a flower, or an entomologist is describing the body of an insect. In academic writing, it is usual to describe a place using the bird's eye view technique. Such a technique is to be found in geographical descriptions and may or may not be accompanied by a photograph or a map. But the writing itself is so detailed that one can visualize the place itself. The pedestrian's view, this technique, is used to emphasize the human aspect of a description, and that is why it is adopted by novelists and other story writers. Now, when you are using, uh, when you are writing spatial descriptions, you use grammar in a special way. The most important information in a sentence usually appears at the beginning. This information tells us what the sentence is about. Example, if you have this sentence, Afghanistan is a landlocked country. Now, the sentence seems to be about Afghanistan. In this case, Afghanistan is also the subject of the sentence. However, if you had this sentence, to the east lies Pakistan. Now, to the east is not the subject of the sentence, but it is very important information as it locates the position of Afghanistan in terms of some reference point which we already know. Now, in this sentence, the organizing principle is the points of the compass, of the compass. You have Afghanistan in the middle, to the north, to the west, to the east. And your organizing principle is, you organize according to the points of the compass. Now, for practice sake, Look at the following texts. You will see them on your screen. Read them and decide for yourself which one is easier to understand. A. I live in Quetta. The capital of Balochistan is Quetta. A part of Pakistan is Balochistan. That's Text A. Now look at text B. I live in Quetta. It is the capital of Balochistan. Balochistan is part of Pakistan. Of the two texts, which was easier to understand? Definitely text B. Text B is easier to understand because the writer uses the beginning of each sentence to lead into the next, guiding the reader through the text in a logical way. From I to Quetta, from Quetta to it, which, is, which stands for Quetta, and from Quetta to Balochistan, and from Balochistan to Pakistan. Now, in that text, the organizing principle or rule is from part to whole, right? In spatial descriptions, 
you will find that logical expressions often appear at the beginning of sentences. Beginning of sentences in the text. And you have phrases like beside the canal, further north, along the track. Right? Now, you shall have some practice. Look at this spatial description of Lahore and underline or just think, decide in your mind the locational expressions that are used to guide the reader through the description. This is a description of Lahore, Lahore, the old and modern city. Notice all the expressions. The hub of the old city of Lahore is the spacious Minare Pakistan ground in what used to be called Minto Park, the place where the historic Lahore resolution demanding the creation of Pakistan was made in 1940. Here, some of the city's main traffic arteries meet. To the southwest of the park are the old Mughal buildings, the Badshahi Mosque built by Emperor Aurangzeb, the old fort dating back to Emperor Akbar, the first Mughal ruler, as well as the famous de Montmorency College of Dentistry. Now, all these are to the southwest of the park. To the northeast is the depleted river Ravi. To the northwest of the park is the tomb of Ali Hajwari, popularly known as Data Sahib, the patron saint of Lahore. Just beyond Data Sahib are located the district and session courts leading on to the main road of Lahore, the Mal. It is lined by important buildings like the old Punjab University, the National College of Arts, the Lahore Museum, as well as hotels. The goods sold in the shops here are marked with fixed prices, which cannot be reduced by bargaining as in the shops in the old walled city. Now let's look at that passage again and see which locational expressions have been used to guide the reader through the description. In the first part, we have the word, the hub, the hub of the old city, right? And then names of various places are given you. The hub, hub means the center, all right. And we are told that here, some of the city's main traffic arteries meet. Then the next locational expression is southwest. Southwest of the park. And again, after giving you the uh, locational expression southwest, a number of buildings, old and modern, are given. The names are given. Then you have the expression to the northeast. Again, it's the point of the compass, northeast of the river Ravi. Then you move to the northwest of the park. And again, certain sites, names of certain buildings, of certain sites are given you. And then you move on and you are told about the main road the main road of Lahore, and again, buildings, names of buildings are given you. Now notice, it is southwest, northeast, northwest. These are all points of the compass, and these are locational expressions that have been used to guide the reader through the description of the passage. Now, Descriptions of uh, 
spatial locations are normally organized according to conventional ways of looking at scenes. And the most common are from general to particular, you move from the general to a particular point, you move from the whole to the particular, or you move from the large to small, you move from the outside to the inside, or you can start a description from the top, go to the bottom. If you are describing a, something that is, you know, lengthwise, you begin from the top and you end up, if you are describing a, a, a building, say. Or you begin from the left and you move to the right, or you begin from the right and go on to the left. Now, these are normal, conventional ways of looking at scenes. And in your writing, if you want to describe something, choose any one of these, these conventional ways, and write accordingly. It will give uh, an organization, a pattern to your writing. The main point is that you must be consistent. Whichever convention you choose, whichever method or pattern you choose for describing a place, be consistent and use it throughout so that the reader, your reader is not confused. Now, that was the first part of writing. In the first part of the lesson, we talked about writing spatial descriptions. You can begin from the top, go down. You can begin from the left, go down to the right. You can begin from the general and come to the particular. You can move from the particular to the general. Now, we shall now consider classification. That is also a very common way, especially for scientists. People dealing with science disciplines, science subjects, science topics, they have to describe things. And it's a very common way of writing. Uh, in, in classification, you will be introduced to ways of classifying things, how you classify things. And you will be introduced how to relate classification to conventions of writing. And then you will have some practice in writing texts which are based on classification. One of the easiest ways to organize things is to look for relationships among objects or ideas and arrange them according to their similarities and differences. You will now look at a set of words and try to put them into groups. In the first set, you have four words, anger, love, fear, emotion, envy. And you notice that they are all words dealing with emotions. Anger, love, fear, envy are all different emotions. So the main word over there is emotion. And under emotion, you have anger, love, fear, envy. envy. B, you have a number of words over there. Table, menu, waiter, restaurant, cash register. Now notice that they are all dealing with the general term is restaurant. And all the other words come under the word restaurant. Because it is in a restaurant that you will find a table and a menu and a waiter and a cash register. In the same way, look at number C. And the words are greetings, a, a wave, hello, hi, salam. These are all words that come under greetings. In the same way, look at D, number D. And the words over there are sleep, dream, 
manager, intelligent, happy, teacher. A number of words. How would you categorize them? Sleep and dream go together. Because you dream only when you sleep. Of course, you would say that you can also dream when you are awake. But that would be a daydream. And then you've got the word manager. And manager and teacher could be put together. Why? Because they are different jobs, different professions. And intelligent and happy can be put together because they are characteristics. Now, you will have noticed that data can be classified in several ways. In A, you classified from the general to the specific. The general was, the general term was emotions and you went down to specific emotions. In B, you categorized according to commonality. Sleep and dream go together. And manager and teacher are both professions, they go together. While intelligent and happy are characteristics or qualities of persons, right? Scientists make great use of this method of organizing things. The way you classify depends on what characteristics you think are important. An important way of classifying things or, or classifying data is through a tree diagram. And scientists use this very often. Look at this tree diagram of fruits and notice it is from the general term fruits and from fruits you go down to specific examples. At the head is the word fruits and then you have three major categories under fruits. Simple fruits, aggregate fruits and multiple fruits. Simple fruits are again divided or categorized into two major parts. One is dehiscent and the other is indehiscent. Dehis dehiscent are of two types, dry, fleshy. Indehiscent are also of the same type, dry and fleshy. Then you have examples. Under dehiscent, you've got the dry category. Under the dry category, you have something like rubber. That is also a fruit. And in the fleshy category, you have balsam. And in the de indehiscent type of fruit, the dry fruit is your almond. And your fleshy fruit is the mango. The second major category, under that you have the fruit clematis. And under multiple fruits, you've got the pineapple. Now this information can be put into text form. Text information in text form can be converted into a diagram tree diagram like this and you shall have practice in writing text of this type. You have a group of sentences, they form a text and this text refers to the classification chart on fruits. Except for the first sentence, they are not in the most logical order. A number of sentences are given you. Only the first one is in the, correct, in, is in the correct position. You try to arrange these sentences according to a logical order to form a complete text which fits the organization of the classification chart. Now you keep looking 
at the classification chart while I read out these sentences for you. Number one, there are three general types of fruits, simple, aggregate and multiple fruits. This should be number one of the text on fruits. The next sentence is, examples of dry dehiscent fruits are fruits of the African tulip, rubber, and the pod of the flame of the forest. Flame of the forest is the name of a tree. The third one is, an aggregate fruit is one which develops from a flower with several ovaries. Number four is example of fleshy indehiscent fruits are the papaya, mango, and banana. Number five, each ovary develops into a separate fruit and so a cluster of fruits may arise from the main fruit stalk. Number six is the guava, tomato and coconut are simple fruits. Number seven, a composite or multiple fruit is one which develops from a group of flowers. Number eight, the jackfruit and the pineapple are examples of multiple fruits. Number nine, both dry and fleshy fruits may be either dehiscent, that is, they split open, allowing the seed to escape when ripe, or indehiscent, that is, they do not split open when ripe. And the last sentence is, Fruits are also classified as dry and fleshy fruits. You keep looking at the tree diagram. Now which sentence? Let's try and put these sentences in the correct order. Sentence number one is fine. It is, it should be the first sentence that there are three general types of fruits. Simple, aggregate and multiple fruits. And if we start writing from, uh, from the left hand side, then the sixth sentence, the guava, tomato and coconut are simple fruits, right? And the tenth sentence, which is fruits are also classified as dry and fleshy, should be your third sentence. And the fourth sentence should be, both dry and fleshy fruits may be either dehiscent, that is they split open, allowing the seed to escape when ripe, or indehiscent, that is they do not split open when ripe. And number five should be, example of fleshy indehiscent fruits are the papaya, mango and banana. This should be followed by, Examples of dry dehiscent fruits are fruits of the African tulip, rubber and the pod of the flame of the forest. This should be followed by an aggregate fruit is one which develops from a flower with several ovaries. And number eight should be each ovary develops into a separate fruit and so a cluster of fruits may arise from the main fruit stalk and your ninth sentence should be a composite. You are moving from the left to the middle and now you have moved to the right side of the tree diagram which is a composite or multiple fruit is one which develops from a group of flowers. And the last sentence should be the example of a composite or multiple fruit and that is the jackfruit and the pineapple are examples of multiple fruits. So, so you noticed that when you are writing a classification, you have to stick to certain conventions. Writing a classification is based on convention. That is, what is a convention? A convention is something that others, the way others have done it you will follow writing 
in the convention that has been set. But remember, it is mainly based on your purpose in making the classification. Whatever is your purpose in making the classification, that is the uppermost thing that should be in your mind. Data and ideas are divided into categories, right? And this is done in a logical way. Now, there are some types of ordering, uh, the some types of order in a classification. One, you can do it according to time, which is you can classify things from older to newest, going back to ancient times, beginning from ancient times to modern times. You can move from the general to the particular. You can talk about emotions and then come down to talking about envy, anger, love, hatred. You can, and then there is a third way of organizing things uh, of, uh, when you are classifying things and that is according to a scale. Your scale could be of importance. You start from the most important to the least important. When you are writing, keep these things in mind. Either you start with the most important thing and you gradually move to the least important. You can also take size. And when you are talking about size, you can either begin from the largest to the smallest or move from the smallest to the largest. A third type of scale is familiarity. You begin from something that is best known to the least known. So let me repeat again for the sake of remembrance that when you are writing a classification, you usually do it according to the conventions that have been set for this type of writing. But it is your purpose that is more important. And you can divide data and ideas into categories and this has to be done in a logical way. Some of the types are that you can organize according to time from the oldest to the newest, right? From the most ancient to the latest. You can organize from the general to the particular or from the particular to the general. And then you can describe, uh, classify things according to a scale. Scale of importance, you have scale of size, you have scale of familiarity. Any one of these would be fine. Now for the sake of a sample, let us look at a table. It's given you on your screen. The general heading is education. And under education, look at the way education has been classified. Education has been classified for you under two broad categories, formal and informal. Under formal, again, there is a division. You have full-time, school, college, university. And then you have part-time. So formal education can be split into two, full-time, part-time. Under part-time, you have evening classes, you have short intensive courses, and you have research-based study, which you do on your own. You can go and join something, and you have research-based study. Now, research-based study can be taken uh, full-time as well. So, you have research-based study uh, under part-time, and you have it under full time. Now these were the categories under formal education. Under informal education, you've got correspondence course, courses, the open university courses, TV broadcasts, radio broadcasts, adult learning centers, and self-study courses. Now that was a sample for you. You can classify things from the general to the particular. That was an example. Here is another example. 
look at this address. See how this letter is addressed. Dr. Ms. Eti Shah, house number 41, street 27, Mohalla Araya, Sialkot, Punjab, Pakistan. What is the order of organization over here? Simple. You will notice that it is from the smallest to the largest. It began with the house number 41, which is the smallest unit. Then it moved on to the street. And from the street, it moved on to the, uh, the Mohalla, the, that whole area. And from that area, it moved on to the city, Sialkot. And from Sialkot, which is, a dist, uh, which is an, um, an area of Punjab, it moved on to Punjab. And from Punjab, it moved on to Pakistan. Notice the way this letter is addressed. You will notice that in uh, some of uh, the way we address letters in, in our languages, it is usually from the largest to the smallest. Many uh, letters that are written in Urdu and even in Arabic, they begin from the largest, from Pakistan, then it will move back to the city, and from the city, it will move to the area, the, uh, the location, from location to the street, from the street to the house, and of course, at the bottom, they have the name. So, that way, of addressing an envelope is correct, so is our way of addressing envelopes. They are both ways of classifying things. Now, uh, you will see a table and some of the most common language that is used in sentences when you are writing classification is shown to you. And you will notice that there are three main ways. Number one, when you are writing a classification, that is the purpose of your writing. These are the expressions that are used in English. Number one, you will write these are and whatever it is types of, notice the colon. There is a colon and then you go on to enumerate or spell out the types, A, B, C, D, whatever. That is one expression, one way of writing. The other is there are whatever, Y, B, C, kinds of, and you will, colon and you will. Then you can even say they, there are Y, whatever, classes of and then you will enumerate. You can also use the, the expression the types, the y types of, the y kinds of, the y classes of, the y categories. Now y I, by y is a symbol. It could stand for anything. The fruits of this type right? The butterflies of this category. You've got the word categories and then you have expression like these are whatever A, B, C, D, whatever you have to say, right? Now that is one way of writing classifications. These are typical English expressions. Let us look at number two. The second type are whatever you are writing about, X consist of, and then you say categories, full stop, these are A, B, C. You can say X or whatever you are describing, birds, beasts, animals, 
whatever, can be divided into categories, into classes, into kinds, right? And then you go on to enumerate. Please make a note of the punctuation that is being used. Notice where you have these are, this is preceded by a full stop. And where you just have A, B, C, that is preceded by a colon. So you can use expressions like consist of or can be divided into, right? Into categories, into classes, into kinds, into types. And then you go on to spell out those types. And the third way of writing classifications, these are common English expressions, is that you start with the type and you say A, B and C are classes of whatever. A, B, C and C are kinds of whatever you have to say. Or you go on to say A, B, C are types of whatever. And then you have A, B, C are categories of X, Y, Z, whatever you have to see. These are very common expressions used in writing classifications. All scientists, all students of science make use of these expressions. What I want you to note is the punctuation marks. Notice in one it is a full stop and then you enumerate. In the other type you have a colon and then you enumerate. These are the three types of main common expressions. Now in today's lesson let me just recap for you what you have learned today. You have learned how texts are organized. They can be organized if you are doing a, a spatial description. You organize according to a pedestrian view or you organize according to a bird's view, right? A bird's eye view. For spatial relationships, you use the, either the pedestrian view or the bird's eye view. And then you have certain expressions for expressing locations, right? You use words like southwest, northwest, if you are using the points of the compass, right? If you are dividing according to that. Or you begin from the outside and you come to the inside. You begin from the top and move to the bottom. You move from the left to the right, from the right to the left. These are different ways of organizing spatial descriptions. You have also learned in today's lesson how data can be classified and arranged in diagrams and texts. Now, you, by now you should be familiar with some of the expressions of classifications and you should be able to use them in sentences and texts. We, you looked at tree diagrams and you learned how to write in a way that illustrated the diagram. And you learned how to write, use specific expressions and with that we come to the end of ways of organizing texts. Longer texts are organized. There are many other ways, but we have concentrated on three major ways. Next time, inshallah, we shall still be on writing, but we will move into another area and that will be the how to write summaries. Summary writing is going to be our next focus and after that we shall talk about uh, we shall focus on areas that pose problems for writers of English, especially the use of the article. Students 
Pakistani students of English have great problems with the use of the article. The, a, uh, an. And then we'll move on to passives and phrasal verbs and tenses, verb tenses. These are, all these are areas that pose problems for students of English. Uh, their writings suffer from these major defects. And now that we are moving towards the end of our course, uh, I shall introduce you to certain language functions. And I hope by the end of this course you will have enough experience of writing in English. And with that, we come to the end of today's lesson. Hope to see you next time. Inshallah. Allah Hafiz.